Hello and welcome. My name is Mario Bernardi of the Grand Tour Europe, and this is obsessed with um, with uh, symmetry and with geometry. And we'll see how Raphael solves that. And it has a beautiful floor on which we can read the name of Pope Julius. Julius II Ligure means Ligure. He was from Liguria, born in Savona. Now the floor has also the cross key. And we know that not just Raphael, but other artists work here at the same time, um, including Lorenzo Lotto and uh, probably Bramantino and a few others. We have in the ceiling these figures, the one in the corners, uh, were probably made uh, before uh, the intervention of Raphael. Well, Raphael made these allegories here, which actually tells us what is painted below. Now, let's get and use a high-resolution picture of, of the um, room so we can actually access it. So here, in the giant arch, you see there's so much gold and mosaics, gilded mosaics, and the symbol of the Della Rovere family, this um, basically um, oak tree, which is going to call it the La Rovere. Rovere means oak tree, it's the same name of the Pope. Now we have Godfather. Godfather is like a grand architect uh, with this squared hat and the universe in his hand and blessing the thing. There are rays of light and there are these 3D dots, gilded dots, something that was used in the Middle Ages in the 1400s to paint um, skies, starry skies. And these cherubs in monochrome that are very elegant, very delicate. Six more angels flying on the side. And then within the clouds, there are also monochrome angels. So it's just a way to classify different um, uh, different angelic figures, as we know from the Bible, that there are different type of angels that have different roles. And you see these little cherubs here with little heads, basically with wings, very, very delicate. In the center, in this round uh, kind of raising sun, is Jesus Christ showing Next, Saint John the Baptist that points at Jesus Christ, which is the first one from and the Virgin Mary. Yeah? Again, more cherubs, more little chubby cherubs. There are four of them at the bottom, which symbols of the four evangelists, each one holding one of the gospels. And on the sides, there are of course prophets and saints and martyrs and masters of the church. I just point some of them. St. Peter here, you can recognize because it's got the cross keys. And on the other side, we have Moses with the rays of light from his head. And we have St. Paul here with the sword again. And then we have St. Lawrence, I think this one is. And here we might have St. John the Evangelist. So we have a number of different figures. Down here, we have the dove symbolizing of the Holy Ghost. So the Trinity just here. Perpendicular, you know, God Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, there's something very peculiar. Of course, the Trinity for the Catholic and most Christians is one God in three different forms, let's say. But um, they've always been represented as three distinct figures, which might be quite interesting for some of you. Down here, you have this beautiful native altar with the Eucharist, which is the real center of Catholicism, the real center of the Christian faith. The fact that the Eucharist, the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, is not a symbol, it's not an allegory, is the true flesh and blood of Christ that we actually participate in during the Mass. So Vasari called it the dispute because it looks like they're having an argument, they're all talking about different aspects. But um, for, and we will see it, well, this main uh, fresco has is facing the large one with the School of Athens, and we see how the two frescoes actually talk to each other. And um, down here we have a number of theologists and saints. We have St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, with a man pointing up in the sky. And then we have a Franciscan here. We have a few others, St. Thomas. Sixtus the Fourth and few other theologists. Among them on this side we have Dante Alighieri, the greatest Italian poet who wrote the Divine Comedy. It's among the theologians because his influence and his vision of the world and hell 
Evan and Bulgari were very important, extremely influential. Here and there, the theologies, the books of theology scattered it up. St. Jerome actually translated the Bible, and it's here next to Brian. And then there's other ones, uh, Gregory um, the Great and a few other figures. Probably here, this is the portrait of Frangelico, a very famous uh, painter, which died actually in Rome at the beginning of 1500, admired by all the artists of the Renaissance by his gracious um, style. And here, someone read it in the, in the book, some living in the gospel, and there's a figure, a beautiful feminine uh, young man, who many believe to be Francesco della Rovere, was the Duke of Urbino. So it was a good thing for Raphael to represent him in this scene because it was the lord of his birthplace, Urbino, in the market region, and also was a nephew of the Pope. So he added good to the rule. I'd like to add that in the background, Raphael does do backgrounds, but he's not making backgrounds, but still he inherits that from the um, Renaissance. You can see that, first of all, there is a beautiful marble um, altar with all these steps and frames. There's a lot of attention to details. This bas relief here, painted here, and that is uh, matched by this little um, fence here. So in order to give a balance, there's a door here, so that it's into the archway. That's why you have to balance this. This, um, and then here in the background, we have somebody building. Uh, building a city, building something, and here we have something quite solid being built. Of course, these are symbols of the theology. They represent the solid construction that is the faith and the theology. And on the, on the other side, the fact that the understanding of the faith, the understanding of the revelation, it is a work in progress. That's why they're all here talking to each other, reading the book, having this kind of conversation. I'm going to call it the the, the the dispute. I would call more the conversation about the Eucharist, about the very meaning of faith. So this is a masterpiece that symbolizes theology and the mission of the church. And probably down here there were bookshelves with books of theology that the Pope um, that the Pope had. Now let's go back on the on the virtual tour. So we have here so the allegory of Theology, theology, which is called Divinarum Rerum Notitia, Divina, sorry, Divina Rerum not, uh, Notitia, so uh, news of divine things, because theology and revelation are not something that is uh, discovered, but it's something that is announced. We are given the revelation, and we have to accept and using the instrument, the tools of theology. Better understand that. On the opposite wall, the School of Athens really creates a big moving scene where you have two main figures in the center, two great philosophers walking. They're walking where? They're walking from this large classical building outside into the center of the room toward the theology. So, in the big, big scheme of things, uh, philosophy and science help us in, to appreciate and understand faith better. So is the classical position of the church, of this grand um, fight, let's see, between reasoning and faith, between something that is discovered through science and understanding and reasoning, and something that is accepted because of an answer of faith. This two for the church are not in opposition because reasoning and understanding of philosophy naturally brings to faith. Uh, I would not give this is what I will when I explain this. I don't mean to be um, giving teaching. This is just the way that the church sees this artwork and that uh, meaning that was behind this artwork. I'm just unlocking it. I don't. I don't necessarily mean that this is true or this is something. This is how Raphael and the church saw that at the time. That's pretty much how the church sees that now. Now we have, uh, this is a picture of the ceiling for a better, for a better uh, detail. So above science, we have here causarum cognitio, knowing what causes things. 
this is the definition of philosophy of science. And let me just get here the school of Athens. This is a great masterpiece, for which we also so lucky to have a cartoon. The cartoon is basically a model, a drawing that the artist will make uh, uh, in preparation for the exhibition of the painting. Now we know that um, uh, most of them are lost. This is one of very rare. And we see that here there's a conception basically of the figures. They don't have the part of ball, which many believe was um, designed, or the idea came from how it came from Donato Bonomant, the architect of the Basilica of Santini. And then there's a figure here missing. Shrink a little bit, and I can get. Yes. Now, you see how basically. See, the picture, figures are pretty much the same, but there is a figure missing here, this one here. Yeah, well, on the other side, they're pretty much all there. Now, this is pretty big. It's uh, two or three times taller than a person, and it's um, in the Biblioteca uh, Ambro in the Pinacoteca Ambrosiana in Milan. If you happen to be in Milan, you can see it. Now, <clears throat> you can see the top is a grand architecture. Probably is what it would look like, the Basilica of St. Peter, in the idea, in the original project by um, it was under construction at that time. It's grand stand. Here we have two classical statues the god Apollo, so the god of the lightning, and the goddess Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. Now, we see, we saw that the definition of philosophy for Raphael is knowing the causes of things, knowing why things happen, how they happen. But this referral here to these two classical thoughts also tell us about more about the philosophy. Philosophy is both an inspiration, it's both is also part of intuition. Uh, it's um, uh, Apollo reminds us that it's something that has to do with our instinct about understanding things. And on the other side, it's Minerva reminds us all this data, all these ideas that we collect, we gather, we elaborate. We need be need to be able to convey them into wisdom. And this is exactly what philosophy does. What philosophy teaches us. How to, what you make of information of our ideas, how to order them, and how to tra transform knowledge into wisdom. And at the center of this gathering of figures, we have the two greatest philosophers for the Italian Renaissance and also for modern philosophy. Plato, the Greek philosopher, and his pupil Aristotle. They represent two complete different approaches to philosophy. And you see on both sides, we have a number of pupils. You know that um, Plato founded the Academia and then uh, uh, Aristotle and the Lyceum, so both of them they have their own schools that lasted a few hundred years. Um, Plato is all in the Timio, which is, is um, one of the dialogues by Plato where he, he speaks about the origin of the world. So this is connected again with the old idea of understanding things. And he is pointing the, the, the sky in a pose which is very similar to the one we could see opposite in the um, in the dispute, um, you can see this figure here up here. So the, there's always the Earth that points out in the sky. Things on Earth are relevant and make sense if we confront with the sky. That's a great message of Plato. The fact that the universe, the universe, is created in uh, ideally perfect. And what we experience in this life is something but an imperfect copy, and that's where imperfection comes. And everything that is bad and negative comes from. But the universe in itself is ideally pure and perfect. On the other side, there is the 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 pupil Aristoteles. Now, um, here we have um, as a strikingly um, resemblance to uh, Leonardo da Vinci. 
Leonardo da Vinci would have arrived in Rome um, while this was being finished, or just this probably was finished by uh, 1514 or around that time. 1513, Leonardo da Vinci arrived in Rome and lived actually in the Vatican for uh, for about three years. So <laughs> of course he knew the Pope uh, Leo the Third Medici by then. Thirteen um, Julius the Second died. Now we have here another artist, probably uh, Bastiano da San Gallo. The San Gallo, a neighborhood in Florence, is, is called San Gallo, and there were a number of artists that came from the era or related to each other. Antonio da San Gallo, il vecchio, Antonio da San Gallo, il giovane, and Bastiano da San Gallo, and few others. Antonio da San Gallo was a friend with Michelangelo, while Bastiano cooperated with with. Uh, with Raphael. Bastiano Sangallo had a nickname because of the way he talked to people, it was very assertive, it gave he had kind of, kind of peculiar tone. So he, he, his nickname was Aristoteles. That's why they thought Aristoteles was was used as a model. It was kind of a mockery thing. And we don't have to be surprised that there are these kind of mocking elements in this in this artist. On the left here we have Socrates, you can recognize his kind of face. <clears throat> so this is Socrates. It looks a bit like a cider or like um, one of those figures that you can find in Rome Basfully teaching to his pupils. Alcibia, this is probably this one of, according to some, Alexander the Great, which was actually uh, Aristotle's pupil. Anyway, he is, it looks like he's counting, he's actually teaching the syllogisms, syllogismus, which is like the basic, um, the basic process of uh, rational thinking, of philosophical thinking. On the far right, we have a number of other philosophers. This one is Epicurus with the leaves in his hair. And there is Averroe, the Arab, uh, represented with the turban. And then here we have Pythagoras and maybe a few other philosophers. The old one here, first on the left, is probably Zeno from Chizzi, the founder of the uh, uh, Stoic uh, school. And there's a kid here, a uh, boy, 10 years old boy or so, uh, very 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 cute and uh, he is probably um let me see i've got it here uh, francesco yeah federico gonzaga here it is uh, the little boy he was actually um a prisoner or well, not like a prisoner this is when federico became like adult um what happened is like uh, he was the son of Lord of Mantua, and for various political reasons, they needed um, an hostage in order to guarantee that uh, they would have respect the, the treaties. And so, in the Vatican, for about two years, this child was kept as hostage to guarantee their respect to some political to some political um, agreements. So it's really an odd story, and of course, the kid. Have been part of a public court at that time, and later on he became, as we saw in the room of Constantine, the commander of the Pope. Um, and then we have our philosophers here, and probably this figure here, um, it's again considered another portrait of Francesco della Rovere, or probably the philosopher Ipaz, the female philosopher, according to some, which is women, or again another philosopher of the ancient school. And then we have Diogenes here, you can recognize him because he has a cap. Diogenes is the founder of the Kinnick School. He was teaching that man should not be distracted by anything in life. So just get back to the bare minimum in life that you need. So when he realized he could comfortably drink from his hands, he threw away the cup. That's why the cup is in. And of course, he's half naked. He's the only one that probably is his body exposed. And then there's this figure here, very different and also missing, as we saw in the original, the original carton. It's not there. So um, Raphael, at some point, changed his mind and added this figure. Now, in the same years where Raphael was painted the room Sansa Signatura, um, there was um, Michelangelo painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which was, of course, very challenging. Um, thing for him to do. And the two of them didn't really like much, although uh, Raphael admired Michelangelo very much, but they didn't really go well together. They met in Florence as well. He didn't, they didn't really like each other. 
So here there's a mockery image of Michelangelo, representing the philosopher Heraclitus, writing his letters. Michelangelo was known to be also a poet and to be quite an introvert person, dedicated a lot to writing. And then he has this boots quite high with the knees quite big. Now, if you compare the knees of the other figure and the general bodies of the other figures, they are all very elegant, very thin. This is quite chunky and big. It reminds a lot of the figures. Michelangelo is missing from some of this huge and heavy body. So he's trying to imitate him and mock him. The portrait is pretty striking in him. And then you can see the big hand. And of course, next to a, mar a block of marble. The other blocks of marble are used, you know, just to, to, to be able to, for the figures to step on them and to acquire them. This case is pretty big, and of course, it reminds him that he's considering himself a um, sculptor rather than anything. I like some details here of the people talking to each other, gesticulating quite a lot. This brings to life a lot the figures. And this one writing here using this very position looks terribly uncomfortable to me. And if you consider also that it might be windy, look at the hair here. There are some elements of movement dynamic that Raphael really inserted. And we can see also by the use of color here that Raphael was like a sponge. He was sucking up everything that Rubens had to offer him. Now working in the body you know, wasn't just working in a very prestigious and well-paid environment. It wasn't all only being able to represent, uh, to work for the Pope, but met a number of very important people. And also, it was a place where you know, lots of people had a chance to see and admire this. So it was a very good uh, presentation and advertisement for him. It was also a place where all the best artists at that time were working. So for him, it was a chance to improve, learn, and evolve. And Raphael, of all the artists of the early Renaissance, was the one that evolved in a very fast way by learning the design from the Florentines, the colors from the Venetian, and bringing basically all this experience together into a new modern style that Vasari called the Maniera Moderna, the modern way. It was really a turning point in the history of art. Here to the right, we have a solitary figure. Um, this um, So Plotino, uh, here we have a solitary figure, probably Plotinus, so the one of the this followers of Plato who reinvented or created Platonism, so a very influential one. And here we have another group. We have uh, Pythagoras, I'm sorry, uh, Pythagoras is over here, this is Euclides, um, uh, Archimedes. Um, and you could see he's probably the portrait of um, Raphael's friend, um, let me see, Raphael's friend, uh, Donato Bramante, that we have a portrait here. It was kind of a bold guy, and um, and then you could see the resemblance, and it's one of those, you can't really see um, his face um, in this detail, uh, with a number of pupils. And then we have Zoroastro, which could be the portrait of Baldassare Castiglione. If I have, I don't know, I think. Um, and um, which was um, another writer, a contemporary author, and uh, Ptolemyus. So this is Zoroastrus, and this is Ptolemyus. The geographer, but at that time was confused with the king of Egypt, Ptolemyus, so that's why it's not crown. And then two other figures. This is probably Apelles, the Greek painter, and is the portrait of Raphael here. So that's young Raphael. We have a portrait. This is a self portrait which is just a CLA, and it's just him. And it was quite common to put your own image in there. And there's another one, probably. Mm -hmm. um, Antonio Bazzi, whose nickname was Sodoma, which I think doesn't need any further comment. It's a grand scene, and you can see all the thinker, thinkers.
coming together to one point, which is the center here. There's also this allegory that points, it goes towards the faith. And here we have also another element, which is the grand architecture. Philosophy is like a grand construction of the world. Now, if we get back to the virtual tour, we see have on the ceiling the allegory of justice here, uh, which is also one of the four uh, virtues uh, of the cardinal virtues. The virtues in total are seven, divided four the cardinal virtues, and three the um, theological virtues. Um, and here we have this odd space above the door, not center. This part was painted by Raphael and probably pupils, uh, or just by people. While this one was painted by another painter, which we're not sure who it was. The Vatican Museums uh, seem to think that it was Lorenzo Lotto, which was a Venetian painter that also cooperated with, with, um, with um, Raphael, and that from which Raphael learned a lot from him. The two great Venetian painters in Rome that brought the Venetian style, the bright colors, the strong colors that were uh, the art of Venice. Um, you see here the architecture is slightly uh, different. We have the figures here above. Let me get a picture where we can see this a little bit better, which would be this one. And here we have the virtues, they are represented by these three ladies. The justice is above, and there are three more here. Fortress, or fortitude, for, uh, uh, which is also symbolized by the, uh, the oak tree, the um, rovere. The rovere is still a symbol of the uh, the, the the, the Pope coat of arms, but also a symbol of uh, strength. Uh, and because um, in Latin, the same word for um, strength here, it's also the uh, word beer uh, rum for um, this name of thing. So it's basically the same word. So this figure reminds a lot of the positioning of some of the symbols in the vault system shop. We'll see that in another episode. And then there are these five cherubs, which three probably represent the theological the uh, virtues. In the center, there is temperance, identified with uh, temperance. As by the definition of St. Thomas, temperance is that disposition of the mind towards um, is to uh, the binding of passions. And that's why we have the mirror, the reflection, because the passion is what is within us. There is the control of what is in us. At the same time, temperance has also some elements of mythology in this representation. The Gorgon symbolizes the need to fight the enemy, our enemy. In this case, the enemy is inside us. It's our, our, our passion. And then the image of Janus, this uh, kind of um, Aboriginal Italian god whose temple was in in, the, in Rome. And um, it was very important deity in Rome, symbolized the passage of times between time of peace and time of war. And also it was believed to be the god who actually taught temperance to humans. That's why it's the symbology is here. And also, um, the figures all have feet on the floor, of course, except temperance. And it's very similar to the one of the tarot cards, uh, it's temperance. And temperance represents one foot in the water and one foot in, uh, on the ground to symbolize the fact that you need to be grounded, but at the same time you need to go with the flow because, of course, passion has to be controlled by this being stopped or denied. I think this is a very interesting um, way how artists create a story. They create a whole universe of meanings, the very simple and basic trait that we love so much. That's why we love, it's like a charade, it's like a, a, a mystery to be sold. And this is the beauty of 
are for me. Last figure here on the right, it's um, prudent. It's got the reins, of course, the prudence is the uh, control of, not of yourself, but of the actions. So one end we have the passions of the control, while prudence is more about um, being, um, knowing when and where and how to take the right actions. And then we have the cherubs, one with a torch, one pointing in the sky, and the one holding the mirror. They symbolize the three uh, theological um, virtues, uh, charity, and uh, uh, hope with a torch, and faith, of course, pointing the sky. And down below, there are the allegory of justice. Now, <clears throat> the, mu the, 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 the virtues are here and the symbol of justice because the justice, it's basically the, um, how do you say, um, a result of the application of virtues. No virtue that cannot be justice in this world. And justice it's order in a system for humans to use. And in this case, there are two different systems. One is the civil or canon of the, the, the Roman law on the left, symbolized by Justinianus giving the pandet, which is basically a collection, a code with all the, the uh, a summary of Roman law. So it's basically most system in West, uh, or in continental Europe, are based on the civil law, on basically on the Roman law. And here on the right, we have the canon law. Um, the Pope um, uh, Gregory the Ninth receiving the decretans uh, from Saint Obebenia IV, and basically uh, he hears the portrait of Pope Julius the Second as it was. Um, have a portrait. Julius II. This is a portrait that Raphael made. There's several copies of this portrait. Beautiful portrait of the Pope. So that's basically in here. And um, picture here. And then surrounded by a number of cardinals. This is Giovanni de Medici, who became then after the Pope died in 1513, Pope with the name of Leo X. Behind him is there's the young Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, who became Cardinal while he was a teenager, I think 16 or 17 years old, that is why he's represented very young. He also would become a Pope with the uh, name of uh, Paul III uh, Farnese, very important Pope for the history of the First one here on the left, as you can see, is Sylvester Stallone, which, which I'm, I'm just joking. Um, it's the Cardinal Ciocchi del Monte, uh, not the very important. Um, uh, uh, cardinal at that time, and here is Giuliano uh, de Medici, the causing of Giovanni. He would become Pope with the name of um, Clement the Seventh. And down now we go back to the last wall. Uh, you can see I'm not describing this to save a bit of time, but down here there are more. Uh, frescoes uh, that symbolize more and more episodes related uh, to, in this case, we have the uh, Sibylla showing to Augustus, the Virgin Mary with the child related to the faith. So we have other uh, images. This were made by Raphael, they're beautiful. Um, this kind of painted um, shelves and uh, opening of doors and the door also of the room is very important I will talk about that last now we saw <clears throat> in the ceiling we saw that we have the religion we have philosophy we have justice and of course we have art and poetry which is defined as this beautiful figure blue and white the colors also how the figures are dressed are related with the symbology and with the allegory. And here in this case, we have this Numine Aflatur. It's, it's 
divine inspiration, is the divine grief that inspires the artist and get better. Here, um, the mount where all the uh, muses and the artists are. Here we have Apollo, the art, the god of inspiring the arts, playing music, surrounded by the muses, um, each one with a different instrument to organize them. Some figures stand out more than others. And here we have the blind poet Homer, and then next to him Dante Alighieri, and then Virgil. There are a few others like Petrarca, Francesco Petrarca, the Bull of Robertio, Saffo. Here we have um, a more Roman and Latin poets and also Ariosto and Torquato d'Asso. So they are both ancient and modern and contemporary artists. And then you can see this laurel trees, which symbolize, of course, the world that they are decorated with. They to be laureates. That's what laureate uh, comes from. It's basically, it was this um, ceremony to which great artists were uh, crowned and with this laurel crown, like the Roman emperors were in the capital in hell. And speaking of which, there is an episode which I really love <coughs> of the, um, which is in the door. Now, this is the detail of the door of the um, a passage between um, the entrance from the room of Eliodorus to the room of the room of the uh, uh, Segnatura, and there is an elephant here, run by someone, and it says here, Poeta Barabal. I'm not sure if I have a detail of that. Um, and you can see that this is actually um, the uh, story of something that really happened is um, basically a joke or we would call it a prank and yes the Pope did pranks too here it is so this elephant was called Hanno uh, whose name was basically um, it was basically a gift Given to the, it was given to the, to the Pope by the. This is this door here. It's this panel here uh, by the King um, of Portugal, and he lived right in the courtyard of the of the of the Belvedere, just um, just next door. So this window is facing there, and. Um, uh, there was a poet, Parabal, it was his name, who really uh, expected to be crowned great poet in the Capitol Hill. And the Pope, uh, Pope Julius, basically made him think that he would have got that. So he got on the horse, on this white horse, and riding him all dressed up, drive, you know, riding this elephant through Rome, which you know, you can imagine many, many people looking at him. At some point, the the elephant, which was very smart and was also trained, basically uh, shake him off his back by making him falling down in the mud. And then basically, with everybody laughing at him, of course, the ceremony didn't take place. The poor man died a couple of years later without ever being crowded. So, the you know, Raphael wanted to represent this image. In that. The elephant actually lived in the courtyard and died not, not long after and was buried actually in the courtyard of the Belvedere. We are in the room which was the antechamber of the room of the signature, which was the room we just saw. And this will be the next episode of the talks. Stay tuned. Now, if you would like to book a private virtual tour on our website, you can see on actually the first page, you could just click on the virtual tour is just on the home page and you can choose the duration the date and just booking or you could just um, send us a message and I'll be glad to I'll be glad to, to answer you can see here there is just the, you can just book the time a preferred time and date and you will be able to choose then which 
of the two of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.